So thank you, everybody, for continuing uh, uh, our session number 32. And uh, our first uh, speaker now will be Tiana Reich from the School of Molecular Sciences at Arizona State University in Tampa. She'll be talking about manipulating nanoparticle reactivity through surface chemistry. Thank you, Tiana. So I'm Tiana Rai from uh, Arizona State University. And yesterday we were talking a lot about uh, curiosity-driven research and societally responsible research. And um, I want to say that's very connected, right? So my uh, curiosity-driven uh, research is uh, actually to try to understand and manipulate uh, reactivity of uh, nanoparticles through understanding and manipulation of surface active sites. And what I want to do with that, oh, I don't have a micro, oh, is this better? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do with that is to try to control the reactivity of nanoparticles. And uh, of course, the most important is uh, to try to uh, fulfill the reactivities towards the societal responsible goals that I have in mind at that time. So something that is my permanent interest since I started in Vincha in 1980s is solar fuels. Um, I always started working on uh, semiconductor nanoparticles in 1981 uh, with cadmium selenide trying to split water at the time and also uh, by coincidence, we stumbled on reaction of CO2 uh, uh, with uh, light-induced chemistries of cadmium uh, sulfide. And my first paper at the time uh, in, uh, uh, oops, this is going by itself for some reason. Sorry. Um, so this, uh, so this solar fuels is a, a topic that is very important today, um, especially towards CO2. Uh, one of the uh, uh, important uh, contributions for uh, global uh, climate change is CO2, uh, uh, enhanced concentration in the air. And if we could remove CO2 by light-induced reactions, we could try to slow, contribute to the fighting of the climate change. And in that respect, I'm trying to use all the different tools that we have these days in uh, operando in particular, uh, x-ray uh, and other uh, techniques to understand these active sites that can enable us to absorb CO2 and to perform reduction uh, uh, using sunlight. The other topic of my research that I'm very um, fond of is uh, trying to use nanoparticles and integrate them with the biological molecules in order to fight cancer. So we are trying to integrate them with the proteins that are going to target nanoparticles to uh, the cancer cells ex exclusively and use uh, uh, their uh, uh, very strong reducing and oxidation activities in order to uh, make the changes in the cells. So uh, my, our latest paper is on uh, trying to use bioluminescence in order to uh, create the light in the body and uh, convert cancer cells, uh, induce apoptosis, and uh, 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 get rid of them. So I'm not going to talk about the second topic because it's a, such a short talk of 20 minutes. I'm going to fo focus uh, on the first topic as this is the year of sustainability. So I thought this would be more appropriate. So what happens when you have a semiconductor particles and you shine a light? You promote an electron from balance to conduction band and these uh, electrons and holes, they have redox potentials that can participate in the redox reactions um, such as uh, CO2 conversion into liquid fuel methanol and water into oxygen. This is actually the ideal and this is how I imagine in 1980s that it's going to be like in a few years we're going to achieve that and this is what's going to happen. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The reason mainly is because there are parallel reactions that can compete 
with the, this desirable reaction, and you can have uh, CO2 transformed into CO, which is a kind of uh, better than having, uh, I guess, CO2, but it's still not enough of a conversion. Uh, conversion into chemical fu uh, liquid fuel would be the best. Also, the, comp uh, the reaction for uh, uh, oxidation of water can end up in formation in peroxide, uh, which is a liquid that can further react with electron and kind of short circuit uh, the whole reaction. So in the reality, when you do this uh, 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 light-induced chemistry with semiconductor particles, you get a mixture of formic acid, aldehydes, methanol, methane, hydrogen, and these all are in very small yields which is not satisfactory for any application. So in the, this field started, as I said, in 1980s, and the first paper that appeared was Kenji Honda in, nine, in 1979 in Nature, and he, they showed actually that you can use very wide back band gap uh, semiconductors, UV, and UV light, in order to pr uh, uh, reduce CO2 and produce different uh, methanol or methane. The uh, yield would increase as the overpotential increases, and as you look uh, here, tungsten trioxide doesn't do anything. TAO2 gives some amount, but uh, uh, I think the uh, silicon carbide is the one that gave the high yield. Um, I always thought that uh, cuprous oxide would be the perfect one because it absorbs the visible light, but yet, because it's a P semiconductor, has a really large overpotential that is almost close to one electron reduction of CO2. Uh, therefore, I wanted to try it for years, and I, uh, the only problem that was uh, in my mind is that cuprous oxide is, is really bad that it has both cathodic and anodic corrosion. So if you shine a light, instead of giving you the fuel, it's going to degrade itself and make copper or make, uh, uh, or make uh, uh, cupric oxide. Uh, but I nevertheless said it's a good model system to try to see if you can use visible light to reduce CO2. And when uh, Yimin Wu, now the professor at Waterloo, Waterloo University, came to my lab as a postdoc, he started synthesizing these nanoparticles. And he took two different syntheses. One that was using glucose and uh, co co copper acetate, and with that he obtained octahedral particles. Once he used ascorbic acid as a re reduce, reducing agent, sorry, oops, um, reducing agent, he got uh, cubic particles. And here, he, this is the image he took on the uh, high on TEM. And he got that these particles are very faceted. And these facets are very selective. The octahedral particle were showing uh, uh, 110 and uh, 111 uh, facets as uh, uh, major participants. Meanwhile, the cubic ones showed 100 as a main uh, facet on them. So are the active sites the same? Are their activity the same? Yimin took uh, octahedral nanoparticles and he got really surprised. They immediately got that once you shine a light on this particle, you produce enormous amount of uh, methanol. We were really amazed because the uh, efficiency was close to 70% internal efficiency. So here is the uh, 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 retention time of the elutes from the, uh, uh, from the uh, 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 now it's like both languages are stopped. It doesn't matter. So, uh, and you can see that the, the same retention time that was obtained for the standard of uh, uh, methanol uh, is the same, but the amount that we measured is really, really high, is in a millimolar uh, uh, concentration. However, the evolution was very fast, and after a few minutes, it kind of leveled off, uh, showing that there are many uh, uh, competing reactions that are coming uh, after that, uh, probably because uh, this methanol that was produced was retaining in the, uh, near the surface of the 
cuprous oxide particles uh, and uh, uh, could not be relieved uh, from the uh, reactant vessel. Uh, by by uh, looking at the uh, GCMS, we saw that actually we get all the peaks that are expected for the methanol confirming uh, uh, our uh, purity of our uh, uh, compound. If you look at the two different particles now, the cubic ones, the cubic ones were much more uh, inactive. They were actually only, the, uh, the amount of methanol that is produced was only 10% compared to those obtained with those particles that are terminated with 110 facets. So this told us that active sites are critically important. So this is one and the same compound. Only different facets can produce tremendous difference in the uh, uh, efficiencies. In order to show uh, that this is really pro product of the uh, uh, photoreduction, not the product of the composition of some organic impurity, uh, we tried to do isotope labeling. Uh, we did the uh, uh, reaction by uh, uh, using uh, car uh, carbon dioxide label labeled with carbon-13, and uh, by using GCMS, we show that now the product is our uh, uh, carbon-13 methanol, uh, which is uh, shifted for one uh, 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 atomic unit to heavier compared to that one of C12. And if you look at the internal quantum efficiency, uh, the one that the, the internal quantum efficiency at the wavelength close to the band gap is almost close to one, and it decreases as you go to the higher uh, energies just because the photons that are absorbed relax and uh, 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 are not used entirely as uh, those close to the band gap. We also uh, surprisingly show that there is a synchronous uh, evolution of oxygen with the light. With the light on, you see evolution of oxygen, and with the light off, the evolution decreases. The uh, uh, efficiency was not that high. It was only 6%. And we found that actually hydrogen peroxide is a uh, uh, much uh, higher production, 12% efficiency. And we think, and this is the problem because as a liquid uh, uh, compound, it stays absorbed on the surface. And once it accumulates, it starts competing with uh, uh, CO2 uh, reduction. Nevertheless, we wanted to show that also oxygen comes from water because a lot of uh, reviewers were suggesting that it might come from the uh, decomposition of cuprous oxide. So we did the isotopic labeling with the uh, of oxygen 18 water. And you can see that in this case, we get the majority of the oxygen as, which, as a mixture of oxygen 16, oxygen 18. And uh, the reason why is that the high concentration is because uh, the CO2 had also uh, oxygen that was 16 labeled, and the main, because of the mechanism, the main product would be mixed 16, 18 oxygen. So this was true. So we wanted to understand really what are the active sites that are, and why this system is performing so well especially when you know that usually it should undergo corrosion like crazy. So we used, uh, we were lucky to be, I was in the Center for Nanoscale Material at Argo National Labs that had this uh, synchrotron uh, nanoprobe extra absorption spectroscopy. This is actually extra absorption that is performed of very, very small volume, micron volume, uh, that you can see the oxidation state that happened only at the place where you probe it and not even smaller than a particle itself. So we use this hummingbird uh, uh, gas flow sample holder in which we uh, developed a, a multi-purpose uh, cell uh, that is also environmental cell that we could flow the CO2 and oxygen and uh, nitrogen when needed, but we could also uh, illuminate the sample, as you can see here, with the laser while measuring 
uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So this is the sample on the grid. You can see uh, this multi uh, model cell has a, uh, you can investigate it with trans high resolution transmission electron microscope to identify the facets that you are measuring. It also can do x ray detection and can be illuminated with the light. So, this is the sample. We chosen this particle because the fluorescence x ray was uh, not too strong. Say, uh, 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 telling us that it's actually a single particle that we are investigating. And this is that the same sin single particle under TM and under X-ray microscopy. And we identified the facets 110100 uh, uh, and one that uh, is 110 that is different from the others. So we wanted to understand now the active sites of each of those facets. And by measuring the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, we could determine that all the sites, all the, so, so it's color coded, right? When green is green, blue is blue, red and black are 110. So all of them, 110 has a probably a little bit uh, uh, more shifted more to the lower energy, identifying that is a little bit more reduced sample compared to the 100, but this is such a tiny shift that uh, was not uh, hindering our measurements. Once we uh, expose it to CO2, what we saw is a relatively large shift of one electron volt to the more positive energy, uh, 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 to the higher energy. Uh, telling us that the oxidation state becomes more positive and it's harder to eject an electron from uh, once the CO2, from copper, once CO2 is absorbed. This is actually telling us that the oxidation state after absorption, just absorption of CO2, was shifted towards more oxidase, so there is an elect electronic density that was delivered from the copper site to CO2. Once we uh, uh, expose it to the light, we saw that actually the, the, uh, the uh, white edge from the sample have gone back or to the original position, uh, telling us that this, uh, uh, this electronic density have been returned to uh, copper sites, active site, and CO2 probably has been reduced and left uh, at the binding site. So this was actually a very, very important uh, insight because we understood that by oxidation, by just simple absorption, when you oxidize the copper site on which uh, CO2 landed, becomes available for photogenerated electrons to come there. So it's actually, you have spatially separated the reducing sites on which CO2 resides and you promote uh, re reductive uh, 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 change of CO2. Uh, when you do the same thing on the 100 facet, there is no change either by absorption or by uh, illumination. Uh, DFT calculations uh, completely support our uh, results, uh, showing that upon absorption, there is a partial charge transfer to CO2 molecules. And this uh, partial charge transfer uh, will, would result in uh, extending of the bond length of uh, uh, copper oxygen. And uh, once uh, this is extended, it becomes more like cupric oxide like compared. Of, is it to that class? Okay. How many? One A minute. minute or two. Okay, better Sorry. rush. Um, anyway, so this also, sh uh, these are the experiments of high resolution uh, X-ray spectra of the diffraction showing that upon illumination of, one of eight hours, there is no change in the uh, 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 oxidation state in the cupric oxide. Or XPS also shows that there is no formation of cupric oxide. Um, also, we applied the uh, uh, coherent, uh, black coherent diffraction imaging, and we have shown that these particles also have synthesis encoded uh, strain, 
And uh, uh, if, if uh, uh, in, in a pristine uh, sample, you have compressive and tensile uh, uh, sides. However, after adsorption of CO2, this is completely changed. The whole particle becomes tensile. So, uh, uh, and uh, if you look at the quantitative uh, changes, you can see that the compressive sides have been changed into tensiles, but tensile sides didn't change much. And the, those uh, 100 that were inactive with the light also didn't change by adsorption or illumination. Uh, DFT calculations show that the adsorption of undercoordinated site of the compressive uh, 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 nanoparticle site is uh, uh, prevalent and that uh, the strain, uh, model strain, by absorbing uh, uh, multiple molecules corresponds to those observed in our experiment. In the meantime, so all the strain is uh, uh, at the surface. In the interior of the particle, there is no change of the strain uh, uh, and that doesn't participate in the reaction. So this gives us actually the opportunity to move forward. Why not use ultrasound to try to induce the strain and promote the reaction, produce the compressive sides, uh, uh, compressive particles that are going to participate and have better, even better efficiency. So to do the acknowledgement, Yimin was the one who did all the experiments with x-rays and the synthesis. Uh, Ian is an expert now at Max Lund uh, that is uh, for X-ray nanoprobe. Uh, uh, Voya Stamenkovic is uh, the one who performed um, XPS measurements. And Nada Dimitrievich helped us with uh, EPR. Uh, I didn't show it here, but uh, she had a major role in determining the mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tiana, very much. I think the discussion will be at the end. And now I would like to invite uh, Tatiana Paratvold uh, from the University of Leuven in Belgium to talk about chemical tools for designing artificial enzymes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, to this, uh, I mean, fantastic event. I, I learned a lot. I learned from the uh, experts that I probably wouldn't have heard otherwise. So I'm very happy to be here and it's always great to be back in Belgrade. Uh, this is my alma mater. I studied here. I'm originally from here. So, um, but now I work at the university, which is uh, known as, I'll just tell you in a moment. So actually I come from Belgium. So I live now and work in Belgium. For those who are not familiar, uh, with, with, with the geography, I mean, but I, I assume many of you are, uh, Belgium is a country which is surrounded by this, uh, you know, it's close to, to you know, France and, and, and Germany and so on, and it's best known for its beer and, and chocolate. Uh, first pralines were invited, invited in Belgium. But it's actually, besides that, uh, Belgium has actually, uh, it, it's a fantastic place because it has a lot of tradition and the place where I work, it's Leuven, so it's, this is this uh, little red spot, 30 kilometers west from, uh, east actually from Brussels, and it's a university, so I work at university, which is an old university with a lot of tradition. It's the oldest university in so-called low countries, so it's founded in the 1425. It's the largest university in the, in the um, low countries, so about like 60,000 students, even more. And it's a university which has been known for uh, many years as a Catholic University of Leuven, and in the last probably decade or last few years, the name has been quietly transformed from Catholic University Leuven to K Leuven. And when people now ask, what does the K stand for? I always tend to say K is now for knowledge. Um, I don't know what I had in mind when I changed the name, but we are now K Leuven. And actually this knowledge, as I would like to say, is um, within the tradition of now this new or modern university because uh, the place or the university has been proclaimed as the most innovative university in Europe for the last, I think, five years in a row. If you'd like to see the, how it has been done, it's the Reuters agency that apparently every year ranks universities based on um, uh, their ability to transform or transfer the scientific knowledge into innovation. So number of spin-offs or patents or, or scientific papers and so on. 
It is a beautiful place. As I said, it's, a, it's an old uh, university. Um, you can see nice buildings, but combined with the modern development of science. So what you see here, it's a chemistry building where um, I, I work, where my team works. And I'm head of the laboratory of bioinorganic chemistry. And so for many people, when you say bioinorganic chemistry, that sounds as a contradiction of terms because people tend to um, always associate life with organic. And it's true that the majority of the molecules in our body are so-called organic molecules composed of car carbon, nitrogen, and, and hydrogen, and so on. However, there are many metals which are also essential for life, and they play an essential role. All of you probably know about the iron. You know, it's a part of hemoglobin, but there are also other metals which are really essential for many living systems, including humans. And so bioinorganic chemistry, which is a sort of like this, I mean, relatively, uh, well, I don't want to say recent, but I mean, one of the mod mo more modern fields of chemistry is on one hand exploring the role of metals in biology, but on the other hand, and this is what my team is doing, is trying to use uh, metal-based compound, compounds, so either inorganic complexes or metal-based materials for some applications in biochemistry or biology. So, all my talk today will be about developing chemical tools to develop materials or inorganic compounds, in our case, to cleave proteins. So we heard this morning fascinating talks by, by a couple of colleagues about designing new functions in protein, designing new proteins, and that's extremely important. On the other hand, what we are doing, we are precisely trying to do the opposite. We are trying to break those, some, of, some of the proteins. And the question is, why would you do this? Why would you actually like to control, con you know, control way, cleave or hydrolyze proteins? Well, this controlled hydrolysis of proteins is an important process in many areas of, uh, of science. So you actually, uh, for different purposes, would like to actually, um, on the precise places, cleave those proteins. And probably one of the most known or most useful examples is examples of proteomics. So proteomics is after genomics. I mean, is experienced sort of like exponential growth in the, in the last few years. And it's a, proteomics is a large scale of protein study, a study, large scale study of protein structure and function. So the exact number of proteins on Earth is not really known. It has been estimated to be 10 million or even more, depending on, on which paper do you, do you read. But the structure of very, very small fraction of those proteins is, is known. So these are large and complex molecules. To identify them, to study the structure, it's not an easy task. And in particular, if you think about certain diseases, um, certain diseases um, are often associated with minute changes or mutations in a protein structure. So if you have sort of like one amino acid which is mutated or different, or you have, I mean, protein isoforms, they are often linked to a certain number of diseases, such as you know, could be cancer, autoimmune disease, or neurological disorders. So the question is how to identify whether those mutations or whether those proteins are present in a certain tissue or sample or biofluid. Well, proteomics, so just sort of to, to give you the, the, the hint of it, um, if you want to analyze a, a proteome or a com composition of proteins in a certain sample, what you have to do, you have to isolate all the proteins in this sample. So this is what is done. So this is proteomics flow in a nutshell. So isolate those proteins. And now you want to sort of look into this mixture of different proteins that you have in a tissue or you have in a biofluid or in a cell culture. And you wanna, you're looking for a certain protein that you know is, for example, associated with a certain condition. How to find out whether that protein is present or not. So what you have to do, you have to analyze this mixture. And in proteomics, the tool, the central tool that is used to analyze those proteins is mass uh, spectrometry. So this is a tool that actually then um, based on, on the mass of, of, of a protein can tell you, I mean, whether this certain protein is present or not. But the thing is, before you can apply this mass spectrometry technique to proteins, you have to actually cleave them in the smaller fragments. Otherwise, you can, you can barely measure them. You cannot you know, ionize them. You cannot actually, it's very difficult to analyze intact proteins. So what is done now in protomics, you have to hydrolyze these peptide uh, proteins into smaller fragments. So these are the key steps. And then you have a mixture of many, many different small fragments. Then you do this mass spectrometric analysis. And then you do actually, um, you analyze this mixture by 
you know, using statistical analysis. And based on this, what the results here can tell how, okay, I think the certain protein is present or it's not present. So this is basically data analysis. You can see this is what protomics does. And the key step for us chemists here, and this is what my talk will be about, is how to, I mean, help develop new tools to hydrolyze those proteins or to cleave those peptide bonds in order to get these shorter fragments. So what do we have to do on a chemical level? So most of you probably know that proteins are so-called yeah, polymers, as you wish to say, uh, which consist of 20 different amino acids. We heard this morning there are many different ways how you can combine these uh, amino acids. So certain protein has a certain sequence. And these amino acids are linked by this peptide or amide bond. So this is the bond uh, which is highlighted here in green. And if you want to cleave this polymer, if you want to fragment it, you have to cleave this peptide bond. Um, but this is extremely, actually, chemically difficult process. I mean, this reaction is very slow. It takes under physiological conditions or under actually room temperature and pH 7. About 500 years is a half life for this reaction, so it means it takes a few thousand of years without any catalyst to break this. So obviously this is slow, it's, uh, it, it's not really, I mean, that, that doesn't make sense, I mean, uh, you know, to, you, you, you need some, some chemical tools if you want to do this in vitro. Obviously in vivo we have a lot of enzymes which very efficiently do this reaction. So trypsin is probably the best known enzyme, which actually is also used in protomics, so it's an enzyme which very efficiently and, and quickly is able to hydrolyze this peptide bond after certain uh, amino acids. So trypsin works well. It's, as I said, very selective. It hydrolyzes after, I think, arginine and lysine, so two, two different amino acids. However, the number actually of shortcomings which are linked to, to this uh, trypsin, first of all, it's expensive, and that's expensive. They're very sensitive to reaction conditions. So, I mean, they only operate under certain uh, conditions of temperature and pH. They also undergo self-digestion. That means they eat up themselves, which is obviously not good. Um, you can not really tune their reactivity and selectivity. The enzymes in general are designed, nature designed them in such a way to just uh, cleave peptide bond under certain residues, and, and that's it. I mean, it's, you have very little ways they exist, but there are very little means to, to manipulate that. And probably for the applications in, in protomics, the most problematic thing is here that trypsin, because it's so selective and it's so efficient, cleaves these proteins on so many places that more than 50% of those protein fragments that you create are less than six amino acids, six amino acids or, or shorter, which means if you use trypsin on a certain protein, you create so many fragments, the statistical analysis later becomes uh, very difficult. And so the need here is to develop chemical catalysts which will hydrolyze proteins, cleave proteins, and create larger fragments, which will be then easier to identify by mass spectrometry and um, statistical analysis. And so basically our goal or our, I mean, um, sort of how we see it, I mean, um, task, how we see it was the, to develop a chemical catalyst, so not, not necessarily enzymatic catalysis, but chemical catalysis that sort of mimic, chemically mimic natural proteases. So we found inspiration in so-called metal proteases. There are enzymes that contain metals in their active site. So this is one of the enzymes called carboxypeptidase A. It's a I mean, it's an enzyme that has zinc in its active sites. But if you see, this enzyme has a protein, so-called shell. I mean, and the metal in its active site, which is so. This, this is the active site. It has zinc, and it's pretty well understood what is the role of this metal, how it actually activates the peptide bonds. So basically, it interacts with the with the, uh, um, uh, with the peptide bond of the incoming protein and uh, via this interaction shown here, activates the peptide bond toward, towards hydrolysis. So now the question is, can you use something simpler? Can you devise a metal complexes which um, will or can do the same reaction, but are much simpler and cheaper and more robust and so on? Here, you have to keep two requirements in mind. So you want something that works 
so that it's able to hydrolyze this extremely kinetically inactive bond, so peptide bond. And on the other hand, you want something which is selective. So this is the, our design of a metal complex that we believed from the beginning could do the job. So we opted for using this uh, class of compounds known as polyoxometallates. So these are soluble metal oxo clusters, so shown here. Why did we use them? Because these compounds, they're water soluble, right? So which is you need when you work with proteins. Uh, they are negatively charged, which is, uh, and they sh have shape. You can see they're actually nanoclusters, so they have a certain shape and they have charge. And because they have a charge, negative charge, and they have a shape, we anticipated and some previous studies have also shown that they actually selectively bind to certain surfaces of proteins. So they actually mix them with proteins and they will just target certain specific parts of, of, of protein surfaces, which is what you, what you want. So this is sort of like a selectivity induced um, uh, fu function of this polyoxometallate core. But you have to make them also catalytically active. And we do this by manipulating this intact structure by putting a catalytically active metal here. In our case, we screen many different metals. The one that works best are zirconium or hafnium because they're very strongly Lewis acid, if chemists still understand what I mean. And so this is the design of our sort of metal complex that we thought should actually uh, or can mimic uh, the function of, uh, of enzymes. And we based our finding actually also on some previous works that show that this polyoxometallist um, <clears throat> really have a tendency to bind to, spe bind to specific protein um, regions. And this was maybe best known example. This is the X-ray structure of ribosome for which Ada Yonat co-shared a uh, Nobel Prize um, in, in uh, 2009. So she was one of the people who helped solve the X-ray structure of ribosome. Ribosome are very complex, large molecules, very difficult to crystallize. And she was actually able to crystallize them thanks to this polyoxometallates because uh, you will see here this crystal structure of, of ribosome, these red spots are all these metal oxo clusters, which she added as to simply to make certain flexible parts of ribosome more rigid, right? So these clusters will go to these flexible, positively charged parts because they're negatively charged and they will rigidify those certain areas and crystallization became more, uh, became easier or possible. And as you see, as a result, we have a crystal structure of ribosome, but it also includes this metal oxo cluster. So the take home messages, they do have tendency to bind to protein surfaces selectively. And we thought, okay, this is a very good sort of a vehicle to bring our catalyst to only certain parts of, of proteins and to do catalysis or to cleave specifically some peptide bonds. Well, does it work? First, we want to see is the reactivity are they actually able at all to hydrolyze these peptide bonds? Is there reactivity there? Reactivity is very difficult to predict. You can design many things, but from my experience as a chemist, reactivity is actually, you can, it's very difficult to design. And when, it, when you are able to see that it works, this is, I mean, in the, in the life of a chemist, a very exciting thing. And so we here took a very minimal substrate. So it's a simple dipeptide, which has the peptide bond. And we were able to see, indeed, when you mix them with this zirconium polyoxometallate or zirconium POM, it efficiently, well, uh, cleaves this peptide bond and you get two from two gly gly. So glycine glycine peptide, you get two um, glycine residues. So you can follow this reaction. You can calculate rate constant. So it works on the reactivity is there. Now, the bigger question was, um, can we hydrolyze proteins? Because this was our target. So can we move from these simple peptides, and it works on many different peptides, we showed that. Can we hydrolyze proteins? How do we do this? Well, indeed, we study hydrolysis of different proteins by using this technique called um, mainly this SDS page technique. So this is a chromatographic technique where each protein has a certain molecular weight, right? And for each intact protein, you see one band here on this gel. And if there is a fragmentation happening, you get different fragments, which are smaller, right? And have a smaller molecular weight. And as a result, you see new additional bands of a more, smaller molecular weights on this, on this uh, chromatographic gel. So this is an indication if you start seeing more bands, 
that you have shorter fragments with smaller molecular weights. So this is how we study this reaction. But in addition, we do a number of different techniques to analyze how this so-called catalyst or artificial enzyme, as you like to call it, or catalyst actually binds to protein surface and how does it actually react. So we developed in the past decade a deep understanding of actually the mode of action of this catalyst. So here are a couple of examples, just quickly. We took uh, as one of the first examples myoglobin, which is a protein that most of you know. This is a protein consisting of 153 amino acids. So this catalyst has a choice among 150 amino acids to cleave them. And we use many different uh, zirconium pumps. As you see here, they all actually have zirconium atoms, but have different shapes and charge and, and, and size and so on. And on, you can see on this gel um, that, so these are now at different pHs we did, and we try all different ones, and they all actually work to different extent, but they all produce smaller protein fragments. So it means they actually selectively, so we see only a few fragments, they really were able to selectively hydrolyze um, this protein. Are they selective? Well, we know they're selective because we only see a few bands. We don't see thousands of different bands. We just see it does happen, hydrolysis does happen only at few, I mean, few peptide bonds, but we didn't know at which ones. And Honestly, at that point, we didn't really uh, care because we didn't design this to be selective towards a certain peptide bond. But nevertheless, we gave our samples to our colleagues, molecular biologists, who then analyzed the samples and came back and say, well, you do have six cleavage sites in this protein, and they're all extremely specific. So all six cleavage sites were uh, after the aspartate residue of this, of this protein. So these catalysts not only are able to cleave peptide bonds, but they really target specific peptide bonds which are next to aspartate residues. So really, I mean, at that point, we did not understand why exactly, but now I think we understand. We did a lot of also theoretical calculations and simulations with our colleagues, and we have pretty good understanding why is this happening after this residue. Then we went to the next step and tried hemoglobin, much larger protein, uh, 572 amino acids, and uh, because we thought, okay, maybe we're first time lucky. Um, but same with hemoglobin, we, show, we have shown that the hydrolysis is selective. We only see uh, formation of few Sorry, bands, a few minutes, and again, very selective, only next to the aspartate residues. So these are very selective catalysts. We're also able to isolate a crystal structure and see how these uh, metal clusters bind specifically to the protein. So we have also, uh, I mean, a complex between substrate and the catalyst itself. So we have deep understanding also how they specifically interact with protein surfaces. We have shown that this is um, actually working towards many different proteins. So I just show you two examples, but we actually show that this method is pretty universal, works on many different proteins that differ in shape and size and charge and so on. And just to conclude, what we then did next, we tried metal organic frameworks. So these are now insoluble materials. The previous clusters were water soluble. These are now nanomaterials, which have zirconium clusters in their structure. So these are the different uh, <coughs> materials that are uh, porous, that have zirconium clusters in their core. and um, Again, are they reactive? We were very surprised and very happy to see that they're extremely active. So these uh, MOFs, so-called, metal organic frameworks, insoluble materials, work are even more, much more effective than the previous class of compounds that I showed you. Um, they're stable, so they actually, in a way, do mimic, I mean, they, they fulfill the requirements for catalysts. They don't change the structure after the reaction. You can recycle them anytime. You can reuse them. We showed this by looking at the images before and after reaction. And they actually work also towards the proteins. So we actually shown that even if you use proteins with these materials, uh, they will produce only a few bands selectively. They're able to cleave specific peptide bonds in these particular proteins. And um, this is my Next to the last slide, um, this method is not only uh, applicable to this MOF808, which I showed you, so we showed that many other MOFs, which are based on zirconium, hafnium, are able to perform actually the same function and work as a so-called nanozymes. So nanozymes are now, I mean, uh, one of the hot topics in material science because they're materials that mimic function of enzymes, and this is precisely what we are hoping to, to, to do here. 
So to conclude, um, I hope I was able to present you that we can use, actually use, that we can use chemical tools to develop um, artificial, well, as I'm, somebody would argue whether this is the right term, but actually chemicals that act as um, enzymes because they have enzyme-like molecular recognition ability to recognize specific parts on protein surface and to uh, specifically hydrolyze certain peptide bonds in proteins. Um, they do this under relative micro conditions. They are remarkably selective. They're remarkably robust, right? They are much more robust than enzymes. The method is versatile, applicable to many proteins, and uh, we've shown the actually also the first example of heterogeneous catalysis. So we use the material, MOF material, to hydrolyze uh, peptide bonds in also different proteins. So many people that need to acknowledge, I work with a brilliant group of people. I must say I'm very fortunate. This is all the um, uh, work of, of generation of, of different students. Um, some of them are listed here. Some of them are shown here. Um, and also, I would like to thank you. There is one Serbian word that you have to learn after three days of being here. It's hvala, means thank you. So I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would be happy to discuss uh, questions during the uh, break. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. I was reminded we have to stick to the time, so we have a sharp deadline at 10 past 12. Uh, our next speaker is Richard Hoover from the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, Huntsville, uh, USA, and he'll be talking about meteorites, comets, rogue planets, and the distribution of biosphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. The current paradigm is that life on Earth originated on Earth by abiotic processes on primordial Earth. Recent discoveries of microfossils and biomolecules in meteorites and of microorganisms and heat producing elements in deep crustal rocks and deep ices suggest that biospheres may be widely distributed throughout the universe. The problem with the origin of life on Earth is that it takes uh, a great deal of work that's been done in paleontology and protocells have never been detected in any of the ancient rock records. Simple cells just simply do not exist. Uh, here we see the DNA gyrase enzyme and the TEM of bacterial flagellar motor. Um, and we now know that from the fossil record, life on Earth began somewhere between 3.8 and 4.2 billion years ago. Uh, Sharov did a study of uh, uh, linear regression uh, of genetic complexity and concluded that possibly the origin of life occurred perhaps as far back as nine to nine and a half billion years. Well, that's a significant problem because the formation of the solar system and the planet Earth occurred about 4.54 billion years ago and first liquid water oceans on Earth around four billion years ago. Well, the requirements for life are very simple. All known life forms require the coexistence of water, energy, and this suite of bioelements, approximately 20 of the 118 chemical elements that are essential for, for life. Water is the second most abundant molecule in the universe. It comprises some 65% of the mass of living cells, it has this polar bent geometry at 104 degrees. It expands on freezing, has high surface tension and boiling point, and that is profoundly important because if water didn't expand on freezing, I wouldn't be talking with you. There would be nothing alive. The maximum density of temperature of water occurs at point three point, uh, plus 3.98 degrees Celsius for fresh water. And for salt water, the Antarctic bottom water has a temperature of minus 0 0.8 to plus 2.0. That is very fascinating because that means that liquid water oceans in icy moons or planets that are covered with ices, they're all alike. They will have the same temperature and they will have had that temperature from the formation of those liquid water oceans. And they will be extremely dark under high pressure, temperature between minus 0.8 C and plus 4 C, depending upon the salinity. 
For a long time, it has been accepted by the scientific community that there is no water in comets. Well, we got images from the Deep Impact mission when uh, the comet 9P Temple 1 was out near, uh, out beyond the orbit of Mars. And if you look carefully, you see that this whole region here where the sun is not shining is shown as having a temperature between 280 and 290 something Celsius. Of course, 273 Celsius is the magic temperature of zero C at which frozen water becomes liquid water. So there is evidence here in Comet 9P Temple 1 of a water ice slush. The spectral data clearly shows uh, water ice absorption bands and we know from the studies of, of a wide variety of comets that they have a black surface that is primarily uh, two things, uh, black rocky material as well as uh, organic material similar to kerogen. The energy can come from a wide variety of sources, from light, heat, food, or chemicals, and this energy is used to transport bioelements across the cell membranes to form biomolecules, drive metabolism, replication, growth, and locomotion. Life is characterized by metabolism, DNA, RNA-driven ordering, chemical complexity, the growth, reaction to stimuli, reproduction, and motility. It's fascinating that a microscopist can distinguish between living organisms and non-living abiotic particles by using an optical microscope because in many cases, living organisms exhibit locomotion uh, when you consider the Rayleigh number of water, it is incredibly uh, large amount of energy that is necessary to propel an, article, uh, an organism the size of a bacterium through water. It's like a human being trying to swim through glass. The dominant elements that are required for life are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. That accounts for about 99% of the cells. There is a small group of uh, minor trace elements that account for less than 1% of the cell mass. If you look at the cell and try to reduce it into its most simplest terms, you can see that for every four carbon atoms, there are approximately seven hydrogen, two oxygen, one nitrogen, and 0.2 phosphorus and 0.2 sulfur. This gives rise to what is the CHON, and it is very interesting that these particles, called cone particles, are a dominant component of the dust ejected by comets and a dominant component of interstellar dust. Homochorality is a signature of life. This was the discovery that was made by Louis Pasteur. The amino acids and proteins that are in, uh, the amino acids in the proteins of cells are the levorotary amino acids and in sugars and DNA and RNA and in the, uh, the exopolysaccharides are the dextrorotary amino acids, uh, dextrorotary uh, sugars. The abiotic chemical processes produce racemic mixtures in which you have equal amounts of the DNL and antiomer. The Orgay meteorite contains only eight of the 20 protein amino acids, some with a significant L excess, and only three of the five nucleobases, cytosine and thymine, are missing. By the Watson-Crick canonical base pairing, uh, you should have uh, equal quantities of cytosine and guanine, and equal quantities of adenine with thymine and uracil. The missing amino acids and the missing nucleobases show that these meteorites are not contaminated by modern biology. In 2008, Martens et al. proved that the nucleobases in the Murchison meteorite were indigenous and extraterrestrial by showing that there are stable uh, isotopes of Del-13C of carbon was dramatically different than the carbon isotopes found in terrestrial biology. Well, cytosine degrades to uracil with a half-life of about 17,000 years, Thymine degrades to xanthine with a half-life of 1.3 million years. Just recently, Oba published a paper in which he reported the detection of cytosine and thymine in the Murchison meteorite, but that material was of the order of two orders of magnitude lower in content than the guanine and uh, and uh, than the guanine level of the meteorite. In 1997. 
uh, we started studying microfossils in the Orgay meteorite. The Orgay meteorite fell in 1864 at 8 o'clock in the, in, the, uh, in the evening. Uh, this is a CI1 carbonaceous chondrite, uh, and over 20 stones were recovered. In 1962, George Klaus and Bartholomew Nagy reported the detection of what they called organized elements in Orgay, and in 1963, Pollock uh, obtained images like this in which she illustrated showing a bent tapered uh, filament with a calyptra type structure. Uh, at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, I obtained scanning electron microscope images showing very similar configurations, uh, such as uh, cyanobacteria in the Murchison meteorite. Here we have a cyanobacteria with a multiseriate filament. This, of course, is a unisariate filament with a tapered uh, filament and a calyptra. In uh, these studies, I started doing collaboratively with academician Alexei Rosanov of the uh, director of the Paleontological Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he had found similar things in the Murchison meteorite to the kind of forms that I had been detecting. Diatoms are unicellular phototrophic uh, algae. Uh, they have very intricate shells. Uh, they utilize chlorophyll, uh, and they yield perhaps as much as 50% or more of the oxygen replenished to the Earth's atmosphere. One of the fascinating things is that even though diatoms have long been considered to be uh, photoautotrophs, we now know that they can carry out organotrophic metabolism in total darkness, and they dominate the microphytoplankton community of the deep dark oceans. In a similar way, it was discovered very recently that cyanobacteria, this is an image taken in Lake Untersee, uh, these cyanobacteria have in, in the deep dark regions of Lake Untersee show these red pigments, uh, uh, carotenoids, and uh, they also have the ability to carry out uh, nitrogen fixation. And in uh, 2018, uh, Puento Sanchez et al. reported that they had discovered cyanobacteria living in the deep, dark, radiogenic crustal rocks of Rio Tinto, and they were using hydrogenase enzymes to carry out their metabolism. So it may well be that cyanobacteria first appeared deep within the rocks of the earth uh, or within rocks of other uh, bodies uh, before they finally became photoautotrophic in the oceans. One of the most critical questions is whether these are, are indigenous biology, the microfossils that we find, or whether they are in fact modern contaminants. Well, as you just heard, it takes a long time for the breakdown of the proteins. Uh, here we see a, an image of a, of a uh, mammoth uh, guard hair that I collected in the far northeast of Siberia. And one of the interesting things is we can see here a very definitive nitrogen peak uh, of, of uh, uh, about 13%, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 11% uh, nitrogen. Uh, and this, of course, is not the same kind of ratio that you expect in modern biology, but this is a 32,000 year old mammoth. It is possible to use energy dispersive X ray spectroscopy and show that the uh, structures found in the meteorites contain nitrogen levels which are along this regime here, whereas some fungi contaminants I found in Murchison and living cyanobacteria have nitrogen levels such as this. Mummies and mammoth tissue and hair are like this, and trilobites and 2.7 billion year old cyanobacteria are again back down to baseline, which I consider less than 0.5 5% because that's the lower limit of detectability of my scanning electron microscope EDS. Here we see a single uh, trichome in the Argay meteorite, uh, and you can see the spectrum here shows that it has basically been permineralized with magnesium sulfate. This one is very intriguing because at this spot X here, we see that you have 82% atomic uh, carbon, 9.2% oxygen. This is very similar to what you would find in anthracite coal, but certainly not in modern biology. 
In 2017, at the uh, Joint Institute of Nuclear Research, uh, working with my colleagues there, we discovered diatoms in the Orgay CI1 carbonaceous meteorite. Diatoms are extremely rare in the meteorite, but the fascinating thing is that this diatom is actually identifiable, uh, and it is very closely allied to Penularia sigeriana, which Fogad discovered in New Zealand uh, in 1955. Here are other diatoms in the Orgay meteorite. Uh, these are very, very clearly diatoms, and uh, there are, are very few people that would argue that diatoms are abiotic. The intriguing thing is that uh, in uh, 1986, working with Sir Fred Hoyle, we were able to show that there was a nice match between the spectrum of diatom uh, uh, and the interstellar dust spectrum of the trapezium nebula here and the spectrum in the IR of the galactic center source. Just recently, uh, 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 Dr. Irakli Shimonia uh, in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, found a very interesting thing when he started looking at carbonaceous, uh, uh, at comet spectra. He found that many of the unidentified lines that could not be linked with minerals or with simple uh, Miller-Urey type organics showed very, very close matches with uh, luciferase, with chlorophyll, with uh, a variety of, of uh, pigments uh, and, uh, and other structures which are clearly complex biomolecules that are not formed by abiotic reactions. The Polinaro meteorite fell in, uh, in Sri Lanka on the 29th of, of December 2012, and the oxygen isotope data done both in Germany and Japan clearly show a Del 17 O that is far away from the terrestrial fractionation line near the Poland Ruhestone. All rocks of the Earth and Moon fall on the terrestrial fractionation line. This meteorite contained incredibly well-preserved diatoms. This is the, uh, the diatom called Alicocera. Uh, the Alicocera ambigua is a extremely well-known diatom on Earth. It is very, very beautifully preserved, in fact, better preserved in the meteorite than I have ever seen in living material. Here is a, 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 a Alicocera ambigua from the earth, and you can see the structures known as the crebra, the areoli, the rimoportula, the ringulis, the separation spines, all of these complex details are readily identifiable. In 2020, uh, Chudiev described navicula Katrixoides uh, uh, from uh, the Varanez region of Russia. And uh, most intriguingly, this diatom was one that I found in the Poland Aurora meteorite in 2014. I couldn't identify it, but you see it has these same kinds of linear slits as are seen in, in this particular navicula. These are three other diatoms showing the incredible preservation of diatoms within the Poland Aurora meteorite. We also find things that are very, very strange. This is a hystricosphere. Hystricospheres have been extinct on Earth for about 500 million years. And we see here these incredibly long spines. This is a 100 micron bar. So these kind of structures you would not expect to find in the fossil record in terrestrial rocks. We also find in Polonarua very strange structures such as this, which I believe quite possibly is an acrotarch, a very, very complex uh, interior structure. We also find long filaments of bacteria, sometimes uh, uh, vibrions, uh, sulfur and sulfate reducing bacteria. Uh, working in collaboration with Dr. Frontis Yeva, we got measurements of, of the uh, trace elements and also the heat producing elements, potassium, uranium, and thorium. And it can be seen here that, for example, these are the carbonaceous meteorites, and these are the values for potassium from the Polonarua stones, which are many orders of magnitude higher than what you find in typical carbonaceous meteorites. The same is true of, of thorium and uranium. These heat-producing elements are found in the deep crustal rocks of Earth. Uh, they've been found in the, uh, in the granites uh, from uh, the Kola super deep borehole. Uh, 
Atomic Gold predicted a deep hot biosphere in 1992, and we now know that the deep hot biosphere does exist on Earth and contains possibly more than 90% of the biomass of archaea and bacteria. The polynero stones have very, very low density, 0.6 to 0.8. These are images from the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft that collected samples of asteroid Bennu. This is gargoyle Saxum, and the data indicates that it has a density very similar to the Polonarua stones. Uh, these stones were argued that they pro would not be able to, uh, to survive uh, transfer through the Earth's atmosphere, but our calculations reveal that they indeed could survive transit through the Earth's atmosphere. One of the most astonishing discoveries quite recently is that Pluto, underneath this icy crust has a liquid water ocean. Pluto does not have near it a large gas giant like is in the case of Enceladus and Europa, uh, where you have Jupiter and, and Saturn being the gas giants. So how is Pluto able to maintain a liquid water ocean? I contend that most probably the crustal rocks of Pluto contain potassium, uranium, and thorium, and produce heating, which can keep the ocean in liquid state for periods of time that are enormous, because the half-life of thorium-232 is 14.2 billion years, the half-life of uranium-238 about 4.5 billion. There are bodies that are coming through our solar system that are clearly extrasolar uh, comets. Uh, this, this is the body that came through called Oumuamua. Uh, it, we know that uh, it was uh, near uh, Captain Star, which was seven light years away, uh, and it was near that uh, star only 8,000 uh, years BCE or 8,500 BCE. Uh, the ability of that kind of a body to travel from a nearby star to the planet Earth in such a small period of time clearly indicates that if there were biology living in aqueous environments within the comet, they could have been transferred to our own solar system and possibly impacted into an ancient ocean or a relatively recent ocean and delivered a cargo of biology. The same is true of interstellar comet 2i Borisov. Basically, we can show that microbes we've found to survive in the Siberian permafrost and polar ice for the order of 8.3 million years. Life in the deep oceans and deep hot rocks of the Earth have survived for over 4 billion years, and the intergalactic transfer time for bio biospheres from rogue planets and uh, with deep oceans is vastly shorter than that, and within those kinds of bodies they would be shielded from solar wind, gamma rays, uh, high energy galactic cosmic rays, but even without shielding, if they're alive and replicating, it doesn't matter if they get radiation damage because one of the fascinating points of life as it continues to grow and replicate and die, then the cycle can go on just as it has done in the Haddle biosphere of the planet Earth from the beginning of time of the planet Earth. These rogue planets could explain the rapid appearance of complex life on Earth if they came from a body like M92, where the average age of the stars of the M92 complex are 10 billion years. Biospheres within the ice and deep crustal rocks could survive such enormous time periods by simply continuing to grow. In conclusion, par the paradigm that life on Earth originated on Earth may be invalid. The conditions for life, water, energy, and biogenic elements coexist on asteroids, comets, planets, and moons of our solar system. The absence of DNA, nucleobases, and proteinogenic amino acids, and the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy data show that the carbon-nitrogen, carbon-oxygen, and carbon-sulfur ratios indicate the biological forms, which are clearly and undeniably biological, are ancient and these results also show that these meteorites are not contaminated by modern microorganisms. The recognizable uh, microfossils of these uh, forms have been found in many different carbonaceous meteorites. Therefore, we conclude extraterrestrial life exists, 
and biospheres may be distributed across the universe in a living state within subcrustal oceans or rocks heated by heat producing elements. And I thank you for your time and attention. And I would like to say that our book on micro, the Atlas of Microfossils in the Orgay Meteorite is available to anyone who wishes it on ResearchGate. Uh, and uh, anyone that would like, I also have it and can give it to you by airdrop or by email. So I thank you very much. And I also want to thank my colleagues uh, at the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research and, uh, and Academician Rosanoff at the Institute of Paleontology uh, of the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences for the wonderful collaboration that it has been possible to do over the last many years. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, our next speaker is my very dear colleague and long-lasting collaborator, Miroslav Adjic from the Vinci Institute, who will be talking about therapeutic strategies against inflammation-associated depression. Thank you, Elena. Uh, OK, uh, let's start. Uh, it's my glad, a great pleasure and honor to be the part of uh, this conference um, dedicated to the basic sciences and uh, for sustainable uh, development. Uh, this presentation presents the summary of data um, uh, from uh, numerous uh, basic um, and uh, clinical research which suggests uh, uh, new uh, directions in the treatment uh, of depression, uh, particularly those, on, uh, those uh, uh, depression associated with the uh, inflammation. But let's start from the beginning and uh, see uh, there is a uh, possible uh, root of the problem um, uh, in major depression. Major depression is the most common mood disorders characterized by the presence of several uh, symptoms uh, that are present for at least uh, two uh, weeks. Um, uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, these symptoms have a cumulative, a cumulative features that usually uh, uh, lead, uh, lead to the functional impairments. Uh, regarding neurobiological hypothesis of uh, major depressive disorders, uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, there is not one single cause of depression. It presents usually a combination of things, such as um, uh, including genetic vulnerability, deficiency of uh, monoamines, uh, dysfunction of specific brain regions, uh, neurotoxic and neurotrophic processes, reduced GABAergic activity, dysregulation of glutamate system, impaired circadian rhythms, alteration of immune system, and uh, altered HPA axis activity. Uh, considering uh, current, uh, currently available treatments for the depression, uh, from uh, this table we can uh, see that many types of antidepressants are available uh, and they usually act uh, by binding uh, to the several target proteins uh, on uh, presynaptic on or postsynaptic neurons. Thus, increasing the level of ne uh, neurotransmitters in synapses, which are usually decrease uh, 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 in uh, patients with depressions. Uh, by, uh, by, binding uh, by binding neurotransmitters um, uh, to the receptors on uh, postsynaptic neurons um, lead to the activation of cellular signaling that at the end lead to the production of um, uh, or expression of uh, BDNF uh, gene for uh, BDNF protein. Uh, BDNF presents the brain-derived neurotrophic factors uh, which regulates the processes of neurogenesis and uh, can affect uh, neural network remodeling uh, to processes that are, that are considered to be the end point of antidepressant uh, actions. Uh, however, uh, many, nearly 30 to 50 percent of patients uh, do not respond to the conventional treatment, uh, which uh, usually uh, uh, leads to the uh, 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 functional impairments, 
and these uh, subjects are considered to have treatment resistant depression um, which emphasize the need for developing new strategies and new therapeutic targets to improve treatment uh, outcome. Uh, a significant percentage of patients with treatment resistant depression exhibited increased markers on inflammation and in the next few slides we are going to see how pro-inflammatory uh, markers affects uh, neuroendocrine, neuroplastic and, uh, processes and metabolism of neurotransmitters. Regarding uh, patients with depression, uh, an abnormal profile of inflammatory cytokines including interleukin-6, interleukin-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor uh, uh, have been found to be uh, increased in some subpopulation of patients with major depressive diso disorder. Uh, this abnormal uh, cytokine levels usually correlates with the severity of the symptoms of the depression, uh, which could be explained uh, through the uh, action of uh, different inflammatory molecules on uh, neuroendocrine function, neuroplastic processes, and the metabolisms of neurotransmitters uh, in the brain. Considering the effect of pro-inflammatory mediators on neuroendocrine process, um, uh, we should emphasize that alteration in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activity presents one of the most reliable neurobiological changes in major depressive disorder, usually, usually characterized by hyperactivity of and impaired HPA axis, glucocorticoid feedback sensitivity. Uh, abnormal HPA axis function in depression usually results uh, from the alteration in glucocorticoid receptor function, which presents the uh, key, molecule, key molecule that regulates the activity of um, uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. From this picture, we can see that several types of cytokines uh, uh, can affect, uh, uh, can affect the function of glucocorticoid um, receptors, including interferon um, alpha, which um, upon binding to its receptor on the, uh, 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 activates um, uh, MAP kinases, which, can, uh, uh, which regulate the activation of activating protein in one, which can remove glucocorticoid receptor from the uh, uh, from the uh, 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 DNA, uh, from the sequences on DNA molecule. Uh, uh, also, uh, tumor necrosis uh, alpha by activating uh, the most prominent um, uh, pro-inflammatory transcri transcriptional factor NF kappa B um, can further affect the glucocorticoid receptor functioning, which, uh, is, uh, which uh, usually leads to the disruption of uh, the glucocorticoid receptor activity and further um, uh, uh, alteration in, uh, in total in HPA axis activity. How do uh, pro-inflammatory markers affect neuroplastic processes and metabolism of um, neurotransmitters? Uh, 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 in, in the cases when, he, when we have elevated levels of uh, pro-inflammatory markers, they are usually uh, followed or associated with the increased level of reactive oxygen species and uh, reactive nitrogen species, which can uh, oxidize a several, uh, uh, several proteins in the brain, including uh, BH4 uh, enzymes that have uh, that uh, that uh, have a very important role um, uh, during monoamine uh, synthesis. Also, uh, cytokines can disrupt the levels of monoaminergic transporters, and they can um, um, uh, induce uh, the uh, enzyme called indole-amine uh, I mean deoxygenase that. Um, uh, metabolites tryptophan into kinurane, which further products can affect glutamatergic transmission and can inhibit um, uh, BDN, BDNF levels. 
considering uh, the effects of antidepressants, we should expect, expect that they usually decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines, increase anti-inflammatory cytokines in human blood samples and brain, um, uh, but number of meta-analyses of um, eligible clinical uh, studies indicated that antidepressants, antidepressants uh, do not usually affect the levels of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, including, including tumor necrosis factor alpha or uh, interleukin-6. Uh, Some cases indicated that when um, uh, SSRI um, uh, class of antidepressants uh, was analyzed separately, a reduction of interleukin-6 levels become uh, significant. The antidepressant effects on inflammation markers depend um, deeply uh, on uh, the antidepressant class. For example, um, uh, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor and tricyclic antidepressants usually increases C-reactive C proteins and interleukin-6, uh, especially in, may, in men. Um, uh, some in vitro studies um, uh, obtained uh, from uh, human hippocampal cells um, uh, suggested that application of uh, venlafaxine and sertraline, two different antidepressants that belong to different classes of antidepressants, uh, have a different effects on the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as that uh, venlafaxine usually decreases the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, while sertraline, uh, contrary to the expectations, exerted pro-inflammatory effects. Um, uh, regarding the effects of antidepressants on pro-inflammatory cytokines, it can be concluded that a different um, uh, or, or even uh, same class of antidepressants have a diverse and inconsistent effect on the majority of cytokine um, uh, levels. Um, uh, in this table, we can see um, uh, listed the, the, the biomarkers um, uh, in uh, humans that uh, can serve as a predictors um, uh, uh, to response to antidepressants, uh, uh, that usually their higher expression levels is usually associated with the resistance to, to the conventionally used antidepressants. Uh, uh, since the alteration of cytokine levels associated with the pathogenesis of mood disorder, as well as to antidepressants responses, anti-inflammatory agents, have been increasingly investigated as novel treatments for major, depress major depression. Uh, numerous preclinical studies as well as clinical trials um, uh, demonstrated that both monotherapy and add-on treatment with anti-inflammatory agents may have um, uh, uh, antidepressant effects, including uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as diclofenac, acetyl salicylic acids, which mechanism of action um, uh, is uh, through the inhibition of uh, cyclo, uh, cyclooxygenase 2, the major en enzyme that turns are uh, hedonic acids to prostaglandin molecule, which presents one of the major pro-inflammatory pro uh, biomarkers. Uh, Anti-cytokine uh, treatments, which include infliximab, etan recepts, um, uh, acts, um, uh, uh, presents the anti-tumor necrosis factor monoclonal anti antibodies, which captures uh, soluble tumor necrosis fact factor uh, and, dis uh, and disrupt its binding to the its receptor on, uh, on cells, which further uh, leads to the decrease of activation of most prominent uh, pro-inflammatory um, uh, transcriptional factor, NF-kappa-B. Uh, Tetracyclines, including, including minocycline, minus um, which presents antibiotics, um, uh, usually have ability to decrease the activation of um, uh, of a number of uh, immune, immune cells, uh, decrease process, processes of apoptosis and proliferation, oxidative stress, uh, inhibit some um, induci inducible enzymes, uh, which um, uh, marks them as anti-inflammatory uh, immunomodu uh, and Im immunomodulatory drugs with uh, significant neuroprotective uh, action. 
statins, well-known cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, uh, besides their effect on cardiometabolic systems, can affect uh, the effects in the nervous system, including plasticity, um, uh, the le uh, neurotransmission, uh, can, uh, they can uh, decrease the level of oxidative stress, excitotoxicity, uh, and decrease the level of glucocorticoids. At the cellular level, they, can, um, uh, in, uh, they, they, they act uh, either on innate or adaptive uh, immunity. Omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids um, um, also can inhibit the sign of uh, pro-inflammation by inhibiting NF-kappa-B pro-inflammatory transcriptional factor and decrease the number of um, the uh, T cell helper uh, T uh, helper cells uh, type one and and uh, two. Uh, considering uh, um, the combined effects of anti-inflammatory drugs and antidepressants in the treatment of um, major ma uh, depression. Um, uh, from this table, we can see that um, uh, you know, preclinical and clinical studies indicate uh, significant effect, mo uh, more significant effect of uh, this combination um, on uh, behavior or on animals, on or. Um, uh, the, the levels of depression in patients. Um, uh, inhibitors of cyclooxygenase uh, 2 uh, also uh, indicating, indicating um, a significant effect of combination of these drugs with antidepressants on, on, on the um, uh, levels of depression, particularly in clinical studies. Uh, neither of studies uh, did not indicate significant side effects. Uh, Anticytokine uh, treatment, which include um, etin recepts and other um, uh, drugs in combination with uh, conventionally used antidepressa uh, antidepressants, um, uh, showed all statistically significant improvement in depressive symptoms. Also, neither of side effects um, uh, uh, were not reported by relevant uh, studies. Um, uh, minor uh, studies that uh, use minocycline as an add-on add therapy, uh, also emphasized um, a synergistic effect of such combination either on behavior in animals or in the reduction of depressive symptoms in the uh, patients. S uh, several st clinical studies uh, indicating um, uh, the presence of some side effects upon the treatment, which was the low uh, or, uh, or, or mild uh, statins as an add-on treatment of depression. Um, uh, 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 similarly, like previous um, uh, studies indicated uh, that statins add-on therapy uh, improved depressive symptoms in all, um, in mostly all, all groups. Also with no, no significant uh, side effects. Regarding um, uh, long chain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid as an adult treatment, uh, uh, most of clinical studies dedicated to the major depressive disorders um, um, uh, showed uh, 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 it, it, that depressive symptoms um, were significantly improved during the uh, use of this combination, except one clinical study um, uh, that included patients with bipolar depression, uh, where um, uh, uh, evidence of, of efficiency were not uh, reported. Considering uh, at the end, in conclusion, uh, we can make uh, several messages to take home. Um, uh, clinical and experimental data uh, highlights the use of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors among all classes of antidepressant as the most beneficial treatments in restraining the um, uh, inflammatory markers in depression, uh, but as we uh, have, uh, have learned, that one uh, that more than one uh, third of the depressed patients are resistant to the such type of treatment. 
um, uh, mounting evidence emphasize, emphasize that anti-inflammatory agents um, might also exert antidepressant effects, and they, besides restraining the processes of inflammation, can also affect the uh, neurotransmitter system. And several clinical trials and meta-analyses support the beneficial effect of anti-inflammatory add-on therapy in depression, um, uh, suggesting that such treatments um, uh, could present an, a, a new strategy in patients with moderate to severe depression. But however, uh, special attention on safety, particularly du du during prolonged periods of anti-inflammatory co-treatments, uh, is necessary. Thank you for your attention. Well, we did very well, so we actually do have some time for questions. So please, if anybody has questions for our speakers, uh, uh, we still have a few minutes before the next session. Stanko Tomic, Institut Vinč, University of Belgrade. Uh, to TNA, if I may. Uh, when you talk about the internal quantum efficiency in your nano, uh, nanoparticle, uh, first, my question is uh, whether it is a quantum dot, is there, they're showing some <coughs> quantum effects? And if there is quantum dot, uh, can you design some sort of phonon bottleneck in order to recover internal, uh, internal quantum efficiency? over 100%. I mean, 100% internal quantum efficiency is not a big deal. I mean, majority of optoelectronic devices are showing close to 100%. And my second question would be, for your line of research with those nanoparticles, uh, does it make sense uh, defining external quantum efficiency? And if you have a look uh, at those as well. Let me try start with the second one. Yeah, we did calculate, I mean, we do have results uh, for uh, in, uh, ex uh, external quantum efficiency and it's 7.5%, which is pretty high compared to its liquid fuel and its hydrogen and, uh, right. Um, for the first question, it is not a quantum dot. Actually, cuprous oxide quantum dots decomposes you look at them because they're so unstable. Uh, they have too many dangling bonds. Um, this, this was on purpose. Uh, uh, we tried to make nanoparticles that are on, on the verge of being microparticles so, so that we can also uh, investigate the facet uh, 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 dependence on the quantum yield. So. And I, I guess the fact that we did not observe corrosion in this system, it's phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, so small ones are not good enough. Yes. I have a question for Tatiana Paratsvok, a great uh, lecture. So I uh, wonder if, uh, if your uh, nanozymes or, or MOFs are cleaving only surface exposed aspartates and can they operate at higher temperature detergent to deter they determine sort of the conformational changes unfolding of proteins? That is also a great question. <laughs> uh, well, we had a look at those aspartates that are cleaved. Obviously, not all of them in protein are cleaved. I mean, uh, out of, if I remember, myoglobin, which has six, um, six are cleaved, but there are actually three additional ones which are not, uh, which are indeed more into the interior of the protein. But we think that actually under the conditions that we use, the protein is also partially unfolded, and that actually facilitates the access uh, of the access of the, of the nanozyme to, to uh, peptide bonds. And we also use now surfactants to actually 
unfold the proteins and make actually more cleavage sites accessible. So there are tools to do that as well. But indeed, that's so a good point. Add, yeah. uh, do you think it's possible to engineer different specificity because it's probably the charge that, that sort of directs it to the aspartate? On the material, you mean? Or on the proteins? The most, the most to be uh, selective against other types of, right? you showed aspartate in exclusively? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I mean, but this, these aspartates are all actually located mostly in the, um, in the, in the sort of positively charged areas of the, of the protein. So there is some electrostatic interaction, but indeed now if you wanna tune the selectivity further, one way would be indeed to, to engineer, I mean, spe special sites that would recognize uh, either the metal or the charge of the material. Indeed, thank you. Um, actually, my question is also to Tatiana regarding the, the proteins. Uh, so. Uh, I, I really like this uh, last two slides about selectivity. So uh, about the selectivity yeah. that you uh, yeah. you explained. So with this um, great results with the selectivity, do you think uh, uh, because the detection of many diseases actually sometimes the biggest challenge is the selectivity. So do you think these proteins can be easily used as the receptors for um, for to detect uh, several um, diseases at the moment or do you think it's still difficult to do that well actually um, we were actually as i said surprised that we saw that selectivity because aspartate selective enzymes are relatively rare i think there's only one enzyme uh, caspase or something which which does that um, so indeed now we haven't got that far to see what can we uh, what are the practical applications of this, indeed. But I mean, uh, we sort of are happy to, de we developed a chemical tool, um, but uh, actually the, the most interesting application we see of our, uh, of our method is because we create fragments which are of protein fragments, peptide fragments, which are relatively large in size. And they're ideal in size for so-called middle down proteomics, which is actually based on analyzing proteins based on larger fragments, not those small fragments of five, six amino acids. So I think that there I see sort of a, a future and, and so it, may, it will make indeed the detection of certain mutation and diseases hopefully uh, easier. And we actually collaborate with the team from Belgrade I mean, to develop this in protonics. Yeah, thank you. Great session, I really enjoyed the talks and I have a question for Richard Hoover. Uh, for the paradigm changing <laughs> perception on the origins of life. So, uh, assuming that the life started five billion years before the solar system was created, what does that imply in your view about uh, extraterrestrial life elsewhere? Well, very simply it implies that life is a cosmic phenomena rather than a strictly terrestrial phenomena. And if, in fact, we were to discover that life exists on Earth, and we know it exists on Earth, and it exists virtually everywhere it could possibly exist on Earth, from the upper reaches of the stratosphere to deep within the haddle zones of the oceans and deep within the Earth's crust, if we were to discover that this is the only place in which there is life, that would be a more astonishing discovery than finding that the Earth was the center of the universe and all of the planets and stars and galaxies and black holes revolved around our own tiny blue dot, which I think would make absolutely no sense. And if one were to advance such a hypothesis, it should be regarded as indeed one of the most astonishing claims that one could possibly make. If I can ask, I, sorry, audience, uh, just a very brief question. Are you aware of any attempt to model life based on the uh, uh, composition that you see in the diatoms? For example, life with three nucleotides instead of four in the genetic code or something like that? Actually, that's fascinating because if you take the Earth as the birthplace of the life that we know, then you change all sorts of parameters that the modelers should be thinking about. Uh, you don't have to concern yourself with what the primordial atmosphere and the primordial ocean look like, and you don't have to try to restrict yourself to something forming in a very, very short time period because that long period of, of prebiotic evolution could have occurred over a time period of billions of years. But I think that one has to also realize this profoundly important role that the radiogenic 
heat producing elements and possibly serpentinization played in the formation of this life because one of the things that we know about the CI1 carbonaceous meteorites is one of their dominant minerals is serpentine, which meant that serpentinization phenomena occurred on the parent bodies of these meteorites, quite probably for a very long time. And I think the parent bodies of these meteorites, the CI1s, were comets, probably the CM2s also. And of course, it didn't have to be a comet, it could be a rogue planet, which has been dislodged from its solar system and is traveling through the cosmos until it finally enters another star system. And chunks of it, or the entire, uh, or the entire planet, collides and, and splashes its material throughout that entire solar system. Thank you. I think we had a question back there. Yeah. Um, I also have a question about the uh, origin of life. Uh, um, perhaps I missed something in your great talk, uh, but um, if you conclude that there are necessary conditions uh, on a variety of places in the universe where life could evolve, uh, what kind of constraints uh, we could um, derive from the fact that life only evolved once on Earth, uh, where conditions are definitely favorable during the four billion of, of life existence? Or do you believe there were multiple? I, I'm sorry, was the question for me? If, if so, could you, uh, pl uh, someone please repeat it more loudly? I did not understand the question. <laughs> um, the question is uh, that um, apparently on Earth, we do have conditions that are favorable for the origin of life because life did originate, uh, does exist here. Uh, if um, these necessary conditions are what allows us uh, to, um, uh, to hypothesize that life is abundant somewhere else in the universe, um, why didn't life evolve multiple times during these four billion of years? And if it didn't, what kind of constraints quantitative constraints we could de uh, derive from this on how frequent or infrequent is life in the universe. Mm -hmm. Just I, I think I got the gist of your question. Uh, I frankly think that uh, these results sort of indicate that life may have originated many, many times in many different places in the cosmos. One of the most interesting things is that all life on Earth seems to adhere to the strict homochirality rules of, of uh, the, the uh, amino acids and sugars, all of the sugars being de-sugars and all of the amino acids being levorotary. Uh, we're hoping to fly a mission to Mars in which we will look for life on Mars by using what we call a chiral labor release experiment in which instead of using the same kind of technique that Gil LeBen used during Viking, we have an arrow in which uh, the Martian regolith is impacted into the arrow and then it's provided with a nutrient media, one half containing uh, L-aminos and D-sugars and the other half D-aminos and L-sugars. And that could answer a very profound question. The results of the labor release experiment were attributed by the scientific community as some kind of unknown, strange alien chemistry. Well, if this experiment is detecting chemistry, then the two responses should be exactly the same, since chemistry doesn't really care about chirality. But if life on Mars exists there today and is very much like life on Earth, then the D-sugar and L-amino nutrients should give a positive growth curve and the alternate chirality should be zero or no growth curve. If the opposite is true, then you would have found a form of life that operates on the alternate chirality, which would clearly be unlike life forms on Earth. So there are a number of things that can be done to try to get more information about uh, life elsewhere in the cosmos. I think one of the most recent ones that we'll have a chance to do is look at the ice in the polar craters of the moon. 
because if that is there, brought there by comets, it may well contain biology, either in frozen dead state or cryopreserved state, or possibly in frozen yet living state. So the craters of the moon will give us our first chance to really hopefully capture some extraterrestrial life forms in living state. Thank you so much. And uh, unfortunately, we have to stop here, but I'm sure we'll keep discussing later on. Thank you. Thank you.